So thank you very much for inviting me and uh, I wish I could be there in person, of course, in Milan. That would be amazing. Um, instead, I'm in my um, bedroom uh, with all of you here. It's very nice. So now uh, what we will do is uh, that I will roughly tell you about the general um, research agenda that I started a couple of years back. And this concerns uh, learning of action models. Uh, I would like to make it general enough that uh, hopefully you will find it as inspiring for your work uh, more broadly in logic. Uh, so I decided to link it with the problem of explainable artificial intelligence. Uh, probably most of you are familiar with those, uh, those issues. Um, so the link is maybe a little bit broad, uh, but it also offers um, motivation. Uh, for my research. So I hope that uh, you will bear with me and agree that there is some sort of a smooth transition between explainable AI and learning action models. Uh, so as um, uh, it was already mentioned, I work at the Technical University of Denmark and since I moved here to, to, to Copenhagen, I started working with Thomas Bolander quite a lot. And he represents more of um, planning, so artificial intelligence uh, area that is more connected to uh, agents planning sequences of actions towards achieving certain goals. I am more of a learning person and uh, since I moved here we decided to join forces and look uh, whether we can combine these two agendas of learning and planning together uh, using our usual uh, working techniques. So in the end of this talk, I will uh, mention some of the results that we obtained together in this collaboration. So a big part of this talk is actually should not be attributed to Thomas Polander, so please don't blame him for most of the things that I'm saying. Uh, but uh, at the end, uh, some of the results will come from our joint work. So um, that's just a small disclaimer. So this is the, roughly the plan. First, I would like to tell you a little bit about explainable artificial intelligence. Um, and here I will use uh, some very nice uh, literature that recently emerged on the topic. Um, it's not mine, but it gives a very nice introduction um, to the topic. Then I will tell you a little bit about action and action representation in AI and in other fields. I'm briefly mentioning. And then finally, I will try to combine those things that I uh, introduced uh, to tell you about action model inference. So what is meant by... Uh, uh, Nina, sorry, sorry. I um, I just see your, your screen uh, on the first slide and it's uh, not full screen. So I was wondering whether you are already... I'm sure I don't see the slides at all. Oh, yeah. No. Can you see it now? Yeah, now I can see the second slide. Can you maybe put it full screen so that that's... Uh... Yes, now it's full screen. Can you see? Uh, no, I, I don't see full screen, but I mean, that's that's all right. Uh, I don't know why this doesn't work. Let's see. Uh, because... Um, um, Now? Still not? N nope. I can see but, it. But it doesn't matter uh, uh, as long as uh, as we can see you're scrolling the slides. That's that's all right. Is it now uh, good or no? Still not? Not for me. I don't know if uh, uh, anyone sees. Uh, it full screen. It's, it's not full screen, but we can go ahead. Provided you, you can see, we can see you when you change slides. I think uh, we can, so it's fine. It's, it's big enough anyway. Don't worry. On my screen, it's full screen, so I am. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, sure. So let's start again with the explainable artificial intelligence. So why do we need explanations, uh, and why do we need? Um, explainable AI and what does it actually mean? So in, in industry in general, AI has been quite a hype. Of course, I mean, what, what industry understands as artificial intelligence is a little bit different than we philosophers or logicians understand by artificial intelligence. But um, 
what they're supposed to be some sort of automated ways of reasoning or learning uh, that will somehow be helpful in making decisions um, in some technical matters. So for instance, uh, one example is um, military purposes. Uh, we can talk about autonomous weapons, autonomous warfare in general. So situations in which uh, decisions can be made automatically by um, some sort of robots or uh, whatever computerized, uh, computerized systems you can think of. So here we, I, I show you this beautiful image of a, a warfare ship, uh, a Swedish uh, anti-submarine um, warfare vessel uh, in which um, there it was con considered for a while to implement methods of automated uh, detection of submarines under the water and also uh, automated decision making of dropping bombs that would actually disable uh, such submarines um, under the sea. And on the right side, you can see an image uh, from an autonomous uh, car just before an accident happened. And the so autonomous I think car there is a problem, uh, Nina. We don't see anything. I don't see anything. Oh. Yeah. Uh, is it a dark screen or? No, no I we just see the second see slide. The first slide. Oh. Oh, now, now, we, now we do. I, I don't know what happens, but you, you talk about images, but we normally don't see them. Now we do see uh, we do see the two images, but before we couldn't. That's very unfortunate. So I will just keep it like that without uh, putting it on full screen for myself, and hopefully this will work now. Oh, uh, that's awful. Yeah, okay. okay. Thanks, Nina. Yeah, excuse me. I just don't see it uh, here, so it's, um, yeah. Problem with teams uh, in general, uh, it's it's uh, it's way of working is some predictable sometimes. But thank you for letting me know. So next time I will change the slide. I will say I'm changing the slide so you can protest before <laughs> I go too far. Um, yes. So I talked about this vessel here. That was what I talked about with submarines uh, before. Can you see it now? What I'm pointing at? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, we're, yes. We're, we're seeing. Yes, good. And on the right hand side, you can see the image from an autonomous car uh, just seconds before the car uh, ran over this uh, cyclist. And it's actually a real case. Um, so there are all sorts of situations in industry and military uh, that, that uh, question the use or that, might run, that we might run into when we try to um, apply this artificial intelligence methods to make to decision making or um, I mean potentially in real life when when lives are threatened uh, and so on. So artificial intelligence gives this bottlenecks with respect to the use of um, automated methods and those are ethical concerns. I mean ethics in AI is now a really big topic and uh, we are trying to reconstruct a lot of ethics uh, for robots or for artificial intelligence and see how these issues will be solved when we talk about or how they can be solved when we talk about robotic um, situations. But there is also the issue of lack of user trust. So when we think of uh, machines that make decisions in daily life, we would like to have some sort of a way to verify whether um, they are trustworthy, whether they are reliable in the way they make their decisions. So. Um, there are at least two levels at which this problem can be tackled. And um, the, the one that I would like to focus on here in this talk is the idea that decisions that are produced by the artificial intelligence uh, should be produced in uh, an interpretable way. So in a way that can be somehow explain that can somehow explain how the decision has been reached. So what mechanism underlie the decision making process? Of course, there is um, a really obvious next level in which we would like to ask that um, the AI or the machines that make decisions, they actually explicitly explain their decisions to human subjects. Right, so this is a sort of a higher level in which a lot of linguistics should be involved. So we would like to have comprehensible level of explanation. Uh, this is not what I'm concerned with, uh, but what I would like to talk about in this uh, lecture is um, a way of learning which uh, natively allows uh, ways to explain what happened. 
um, explained not in the way that is readily available for the subject regular person, but rather in a way that uh, can be analyzed by experts. So what is the scope of uh, explainable AI? It has a really nice, uh, so now I changed the slide. Can you see that I changed the slide? Yes, that's all right, that's yes. okay. So now we have uh, the scope of AI, uh, XAI, uh, XAI, a very nice acronym. Uh, this, this acronym stands for Explainable Artificial Intelligence. And here what I would like to really uh, warmly recommend to you is uh, the paper by Tim Miller, uh, Explanations in Artificial Intelligence, Insights from the Social Sciences. This is an extremely nice paper, uh, extremely broad, that um, tackles all sorts of different uh, topics related to explainable AI. And it gives an extremely nice overview of how explanation has been studied in many different disciplines, in cognitive science, in social sciences, in philosophy. There is a little bit about how it was handled in logic, of course, not a lot. Uh, we are kind of, I mean, I represent quite an um, obscure part. I mean, if you look about, uh, if you look at AI in broad, uh, in broad terms, it's a, logic is kind of a small thing. Uh, but Yes, he positions uh, hum uh, explainable AI in the field of human agent interaction, so between social science, artificial intelligence, and human computer interaction. And he says that um, all of those fields should inform uh, our concerns with um, explanations in artificial intelligence. So we should not neglect those uh, hum somehow humanity subjects when we are trying to construct um, explanations. So, for instance, what he says is that uh, there is a bunch of properties that explanations should um, comply to. Uh, so, for instance, uh, there are these four issues. Uh, one, that explanations should be con con contrastive. So, he suggests that explanations in artificial intelligence should be based on counterfactuals in the sense that uh, when we are trying to explain P, it's not only that we are trying to explain why P happened, but why P happened rather than something else that maybe would be the a desirable outcome. He also says that explanation should be selective. So when we are trying to explain a decision of a machine or a machine tries to explain themselves, they should, they should be able to select uh, parts of um, the issue that are extremely relevant for the receiver of this information. So um, they should not talk about all possible causality involved in the situation, but rather uh, be selective about it. And finally, and this is a related uh, issue, is that explanations uh, should be social in the sense that they should somehow take into account that explanations happen uh, in communication and interact in interaction. So when you're trying to explain something to somebody, you should already take into account the beliefs and the uh, uh, cognitive um, component of the, your interlocutor, so of the person that you're talking to. And uh, here it's actually for those of you that are familiar with epistemic logic, uh, this is where it somehow connects. I mean, epistemic logic representing knowledge and belief states of other agents is kind of a useful tool to think about those issues. And finally, the, the last element of this whole uh, um, enumeration would be, uh, that's quite important to us, he says that probabilities probably don't matter for explanations so much. And he says that uh, quite explicitly, and um, what is meant uh, by that is that um, if you think of AI as it usually is thought of nowadays um, in terms of machine learning, then there is a really huge temptation to think of um, AI as some sort of a probabilistic tool, most of all. Um, however, when you think about what kind of explanations are satisfactory to us when we um, think of uh, good explanations. Those are explanations that don't just um, um, swipe things away by saying, OK, I made this decision because it had a higher probability. Uh, when, the, when a student asks you why they received, uh, why didn't, didn't pass the exam, you don't give them an argument from a sort of probability distribution over the abilities of the students. You rather tell, you write, you rather tell them some sort of qualitative information of how um, their particular solutions to exam problems made them fail. 
So I like this last point especially because I'm not concerned in my work, I mean sometimes I am, but mostly I'm concerned with symbolic learning methods. So um, learning that does not rely on, uh, on probabilities, prob probabilistic uh, problems and concerned more with exact learning, in which we're trying to infer the underlying structure of um, some sort of automaton based on observations. If there are any questions at any point, please let me know. Um, did you see that I changed my slide? Yes. yes. So let me just give you a little bit of a, of a nice example of this uh, type of concern. So um, Miller's example here. Um, so we have here an AI engine that um, looks at photographs of anthropods which are some sort of like bugs and things like that. I don't really know exactly what, what is the, the spectrum of this term, but um, yeah. So the idea is that we look at different animals and uh, by inspecting several parameters of these animals, we are trying to learn the notion of anthropods um, in machine learning, right? So here we have for the a classifier that looks at different uh, types and classifies them according to the number of legs, whether they are stingy or not, how many eyes they have, uh, do they have compound eyes, do they have wings, or how many uh, they have. So I, I think you're familiar with this sort of idea that um, in machine learning we are often actually classify objects. Uh, we are trying to put them under a certain label. So okay, I mean, after a while, you feed the machine learning algorithm this a lot of things like that, and, and, and they learn, right? So the machine learning manages to figure out some sort of nice classification method based on these several parameters after observing, I don't know, 10,000 of images of different anthropods. Now, what uh, Miller uh, says is that, um, well, this is the first step, but now you know, if we are concerned with explainable AI, we would like this AI or the connected machinery to be able to uh, answer different questions about the specification. So here is an example of a dialogue that a person could have with an explanation agent. So for instance, a person could ask, why is image J labeled as a spider instead of a beetle? And an explanation is because the anthropod in image J has eight legs consistent with those in the category spider, while those in middle have six legs. Why did you infer that the anthropod in image J had eight legs instead of six? I counted the eight legs and I found as I have just high, um, that I found as I've just highlighted in the image view now, and an explanation agent shows the image with eight legs counted. How do you know that the spider have eight legs and, and so on? And finally, I like this question here, but an octopus can have eight legs too. Why did you not classify an image as an octopus? Because my function uh, is only to classify anthropods. And so, I mean, th this is just to show you that explanation could be an interesting element of an AI engine in uh, such a sense. And you can easily, I mean, we are, here we are talking about spiders and things like that. But uh, you could also imagine that this classifier concerns, for instance, um, a decision making by uh, the, uh, of, of an autonomous car in different dangerous situations or um, in the situation of trolley problem, for instance. So such questions could serve as some sort of interrogation to the machine of why a certain decision is being made. And of, of course, the, the huge concern is how to make those answers relevant uh, for a human subject. And in his paper, Miller, Miller actually offers uh, a really nice overview of how explanation has been tackled in social sciences, cognitive science, and so on. So how to, what, what different discipline, uh, disciplines did, did in order to um, understand uh, this underlying mechanisms of explanation. So in my opinion, actually, if you're concerned with explanations in AI, looking at that paper is probably an infinite source of, of inspiration. Um, and maybe even some solutions to this problem. So the issue of explanation has already reached uh, quite high levels when it comes to society and artificial intelligence. 
So here I'm quoting a paper uh, written, among others, by Tarek Besson. Um, I don't think probably some of you know Tarek. Um, he is part of um, a commission in Germany uh, that is looking into trying to apply um, AI in real life and trying to establish some sort of guidelines uh, for the lawful applications. And in their paper, I'm pretty sure that this paper since has been already published in something else, an archive, but I already I, I looked at it uh, in that version. Um, they propose a classification of um, levels of availability of explanations in AI. So first of all, that they say that, okay, there are these opaque systems, systems that offer no insight whatsoever into the algorithmic mechanism that underlies uh, the decision-making process. Okay, so this would be, for instance, the very opaque AI classifiers that somehow the deep neural networks would be such an example uh, in which something happens and we have the solution, but we have very little access to what is the underlying method of making those decisions. Um, then there are interpretable systems um, that I would like to argue that some of my work um, touches upon. And here the idea is that users of the system can mathematically analyze the algorithmic mechanism that underlies the decision making. And finally, there is the level of com comprehensible systems in which uh, the machine actually emits symbols that uh, are already enabling user-driven explanations. So, so that it's on such a low level, on such a maybe high level, depends how you look at it, on such a high level that is directly accessible to any user that has like basic language skills or um, just some sort of basic training uh, in communication. Um, yes. So what I would like to talk about is somewhere here. So I'm concerned with um, AI that actually gives offers some sort of insight into what's going on. Um, and you can get this access if you have enough mathematical training. So it's not explainable in the sense, you know, just direct explanations as you would explain things to a child, but rather um, sort of an expert-based explanation. How does it link to learning and planning? In the recent workshop of each guy, International Joint Conference for Artificial Intelligence, in um, 2017, there was a whole workshop devoted to explainable AI. And uh, to, in the preface to this, to the volume from this workshop, you can uh, read the following passage: Explainable AI concerns the challenge of shedding light on opaque machine learning models in contexts for which transparency is important. Uh, where these models could be used to solve analysis, uh, for example, classification or synthesis task planning. And here I highlight planning because that's what we are concerned with here in this talk, design. Indeed, most machine learning research usually focuses on prediction tasks, but rarely on providing explanations, justifications for them. Yet users of many applications, for instance, related to autonomous control, medical, financial investment, require understanding before committing to decisions with inherent risk. Here is an example. A delivery drone should explain why it's operating normally um, or why it's a suspended behavior, uh, for instance, to avoid placing its fragile package in an unsafe location. An intelligent decision aid should explain its recommendation of an aggressive medical intervention and so on. So yes, what I'm saying simply in this bunch of slides is that this topic is quite important and relevant and people think of it uh, nowadays. Um, okay, this is 2017, but I mean, it's not so long ago, given we are in quarantine also. So, uh, yes. So in my abstract, I told you that I'm uh, planning to, in this talk, I will resurrect the old topic of grammar in France, and this is indeed what I want to do. Uh, and I would like to claim that uh, grammar inference as a um, general algorithmic uh, learning method has some sort of inherent explainability level in, embedded in it uh, that can be natively used uh, in AI. And it has been forgotten because of um, the quite dominant paradigm of general machine learning as it's understood nowadays. And of course, I mean, we all know that symbolic and sub-symbolic, symbolic and probabilistic methods, they 
keep fluctuating. So it's sometimes the probabilis the probabilistic approaches are on top uh, in research and then the logic resurfaces again and so on. So I'm not, I, I am really hopeful that we'll be able to find balance here, but indeed there has been quite a hype with the development of um, deep neural networks and, and those techniques uh, and the hype concerns machine learning. Uh, in grammar inference originally, what we wanted um, was that um, the learning process actually um, concerned learning a, a finite set of hidden rules. Some rules that uh, causal, on, or causal or other type of rules uh, that led to um, either discovering the generator, so a like a Turing machine, for instance, a collection of production rules that allow us to generate the observations that we we've encountered during learning or a tester. And here you can also think of a decision procedure also in terms of mach uh, Turing machine, for instance. Um, and here a tester would be a finite state machine or an automaton of some kind uh, that allows us to distinguish whether a certain string is part of it or not. So of course, machine learning in general um, is um, such a procedure. Um, th this is this is an instance of a machine learning uh, technique that has uh, at its disposal discrete combinatorial objects such as strings, trees, and graphs, and tries to figure out in a more qualitative way, perhaps. Uh, what kind of automata or what kind of uh, Turing machine or what kind of generator underlies these observations that were given in terms of strings, trees or graphs. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with grammar inference. I would like to just give you a brief example of uh, what I mean by grammar inference. Uh, so here in the picture we can see Dana Anglui, uh, Dana Anglui and she's a mother of, um, of grammar inference. But actually, in this photo, she's even pregnant, so it's a funny uh, coincidence. But um, she um, came up with the concept of uh, learning in, um, especially applied to regular languages, so quite low in Chomsky hierarchy, and she came up with um, some sort of symbolic learning methods that uh, went across Chomsky hierarchy in a very interesting way. So I really encourage you to look at her work. So for instance, what uh, she um, showed is that regular languages are not learnable in the limit from positive data. They are learnable in the limit from positive and negative data. And moreover, they are finitely learnable uh, with queries. And this final uh, example of finite learnability with queries of uh, regular languages is a very realistic artificial intelligence model in the sense that what happens there is that a machine is presented some, with a set of strings and uh, the, the learning process is supposed to out, output a finite automaton that is able to um, test or um, accept this bunch of strings. Nina, can I ask a question? Sure, of course. Uh, the, the fact that uh, learnability is here um, uh, possible in the limit from positive and negative data means that it is uh, uh, a semi-decidable problem or how do how do I see this in terms of can I compare it in terms of decidability? Uh, yes uh, so learnability in the limit is sigma zero two mm -hmm. so um, what you want to do here is go one level above um, decidability so in some particular cases some good notions can be um, delta zero two in the sense that um, they are actually both um, they are they are decidable in the limit. Semi-decidable is the case of um, when you have an existing so yeah when you have a recursively enumerable situations right mm -hmm. and this is a level higher uh, from from that. So when I say a learnability in the limit, I mean uh, if an element is in the set, then after some finite point, from that point on, all answers will be positive. Um, so all answers will be one. The problem is that you can't really know uh, when this moment already arrived. So the moment when um, the tail of your computation is one will not be computable. 
Um, so this corresponds to um, a recursion in the limit, and it's a higher level of um, of uh, arithmetical hierarchy. Uh, maybe you can ask me some other questions, so that I, because I'm not sure if I answered properly. No, well, okay. So let me. I think you answered, but let me rephrase just for my clarity. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, does this mean that if I have a, for a given language a string which is, um, if I have all the strings which are in and all the strings which are out, uh, right, uh, given to me in the limit, then that only under that condition can I assume the language to be uh, learnable? Is yes. That, is that correct? Yes. While if I only assume that I have uh, the data, uh, so the the strings, the strings that uh, a way to test the strings that are in. Then I can still not uh, uh, learn the language in the limit. Yes. Okay, so the problem, the problem here comes from the fact that um, regular languages, if you look at them in the traditional way how they are defined in Chomsky hierarchy, uh, regular languages actually include or finite languages as well. So whatever is a finite language, finite set of strings would be regular at the same time. Because you can just have many, many, many uh, rules uh, in your automaton that will just accept this language. Yeah. And then on top of that, you have these interesting cases of regular languages and the ones for which like regular expressions mm -hmm. would be relevant, you know, like sort of infinite languages which can be represented in a finite way. Now, the problem is that uh, the proof of this uh, theorem goes uh, through this argument that if you have infinitely many um, finite languages that include each other, so they are larger and larger, you will never know when to actually switch to the infinite language because you will stay within this larger and larger finite languages and you will, you will never have any way to jump over to the um, non-trivial irregular languages. This is known under the name of um, the second Gold's theorem in formal learning theory. Not a Gudos theorem, but God theorem. They are like so. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yes. So if you're interested more in this uh, direction, I can also recommend later some literature on that topic. And also, I myself uh, applied some of these techniques, proof techniques, in belief revision, which probably is relevant for different reasons. Um, but yeah, for now, maybe given the time, I'll just go on and. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So here the idea of uh, learning proposed by Dana Angloin is a so-called learning with queries and the algorithm is known under a star label. And the goal is, um, I mean, the whole scenario goes as follows. So we look at strings. Here they are super, like, just represented as strings over the alphabet A and B. Can you see my slide now? Because it's quite good, it would be good if you saw it. Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah. Um, and the idea is that the algorithm is looking at, um, at strings that appear um, somehow in an enumeration and is constructing some sort of transition table, a quite standard notion in uh, automata theory, uh, that represents the automaton that underlies the observations. And in this particular algorithm, the nice thing is that it's not only observations that happen, but that there are also queries. So the learner looks at their transition table and they see like, OK, I'm missing, I'm missing some knowledge. I don't know how to close the table on new information. So I can ask the teacher, there is an oracle, um, perhaps a human subject in this context. I can ask the human subject to provide me with uh, the membership query for this particular string. And then I construct a finite automaton based on that. Uh, the source 87 quite a while ago. That's why I'm saying that I'm resurrecting th things here because they, they've been kind of dead for a while. Uh, I did my master thesis on this topic, by the way, so it, it's been a while since then. Um, yes. So, okay. And this is a tricky point. So I don't know to what extent you agree with me, but I would say that this type of learning provide some sort of insight to the explanation of the classification. In the sense that 
we learn something. So we learn from observations, we look at strings. We know that the strings conform to a certain mechanism that we are looking for. And while we do that, we construct a finite state machine that allows us to accept strings that we actually did observe in some sort of way. Okay, so now if um, there is a problem, so later on if we use this machine for something, there is a problem, we can see which transition caused the problem and how this finite state machine can be perhaps tinkered with in order to accommodate uh, these missing steps, right? So this type of learning, I mean, we can call it exact learning in the sense that it offers some sort of exact answer to what is the underlying mechanism under the classification and under, the, under membership that is a little bit more workable than just, you know, classify in the sense of a tool that predicts the future instances rather than giving an insight on how the decisions of whether a string belongs to a, a language or not um, is reached. So, of course, grammar inference has been used all over the place. So, it's been used in the semantic parsing, in natural language understanding, in example-based translation, in morpheme analysis, in lossless data compression, um, uh, in uh, minimum, minimum description land, uh, in statistical inference. So, what I would like to say is that the perspective of grammar inference, um, it's also good for these new questions of uh, explainability in artificial intelligence. So what I'm saying is that we could argue that exact learning that grammar inference offers, so the sort of insight into the underlying structure of the presented um, samples, supports native interpretability in machine learning. Okay, so now I suppose you object uh, internally <laughs> to this. Um, because it's, uh, the, those, those things are so different, but uh, let me show you what I think. So, um, what I would like to apply these techniques to is action learning. Um, and actually in artificial intelligence is a really big topic and also elsewhere. Um, we observed dynamic, so-called dynamic turns all over the place um, in different decades. And dynamic turns, by, by a dynamic turn I mean a turn in the paradigm shift that told us, okay, the discipline should not only tackle the static component of situations, but it should also tackle the dynamic component. I mean, you know, philosophically speaking, it's a question of what kind of ontology you assume, whether you have an ontology of objects that uh, you, you just look at the models that are static, static representative first order models or whatever models uh, that represent situations, or do you also want to focus on the semantics of transitions, like how the models can change from one model into another model? And these turns have been happening all over the place. So uh, in 1980s, uh, in computer science, it's been observed that actions are quite crucial for robotics, like the internal representation of actions. In logic, um, it, it's been happening also before the 90s, but in the 90s, there was this quite big um, kind of kind of label of you know, fundamentum uh, in terms of the dynamic logic and dynamic epistemic logic and how important action is. And in cognitive science in 2000s, uh, also uh, people started postulating that uh, there are cognitive representations of actions that are irreducible, that, that cognitive representations of actions should be irreducible to the static uh, perception. That there is some sort of huge component in cognition that uh, corresponds to performing actions, interpreting actions, that is not reducible to static elements. So many of you are probably with a deep philosophical training that will probably render this slide uh, completely useless. But I mean, of course, in this context, what you have to think of is what is an action? So uh, like, how do we actually tackle the issue of actions? Are they important or not? So some postures from Stanford Encyclopedia um, of philosophy, um, an action should be adaptively driven by goals. Uh, it involves some degree of volitional control, requires planning and decision among alternatives, involves prediction and anticipation of outcome. It's often associated with a sense of agency. 
its theory must accommodate agents' bounded abilities, and so on. Right? So it's sort of a descriptive way of looking at action, what action should be and what it shouldn't be. And again, um, it will be interpreted differently in different disciplines. Um, some intuitions about uh, action in, com uh, in cognitive science and neuroscience. In cognitive science, it's often said that um, actually cognition is a capacity of generating structure by action. And um, actions are grounded in basic sensory motor behaviors that give rise to more complex forms of actions. Agents um, first learn to associate movements with their outcomes, such as uh, ensuing sensory changes. Subsequently, the learned, the learned patterns can be used for action selection and eventually enable the development of intentional action. Intentional actions do not necessarily always involve overt movements, such as in the case of mental calculation. So here we, I mean, this is super broad. Here we, talk, we are talking not only about actions in the, um, in the outside world that an agent might perform, but also mental operations. So playing with, with the concepts in your head or um, imagining that you're actually performing an action, all sorts of things like that. So all these con considerations of actions, of course, I mean, as, as it usually happens in logic and philosophy, they somehow uh, made their way into artificial intelligence. And why they are so important? They are important because we want to have robots uh, that act in real world. And here on the left, you can see Shaky, uh, the robot, together with his inventor. And uh, Shaky was the first um, robot that was actually able to move around this sort of like a um, simple world um, using logic, mostly symbolic AI. Um, success, uh, like it was a successful robot in the sense of achieving certain goals in the environment. Um, I can also provide you later with a movie there is a very nice movie on YouTube, a documentary about this robot. On the right side, you can see our um, R2 DTU. Uh, my university is called DTU. We have this R2 DTU now. Thomas Bolander, bought, my, my collaborator, bought uh, this robot. It costs about 10,000 euros, I think. So we have two of those in our department now. And they stand in our uh, common space. And Thomas uh, implements uh, some of our uh, work on, uh, on those uh, cute little puppets. Uh, he also managed to implement false belief task for those of you that are familiar with, uh, with the concept. So um, it's, it's quite an interesting um, direction. So given all these advanced considerations, if you look at how actually actions are represented in artificial intelligence nowadays, they are super simple. So the simplest idea of an action is that um, is that um, is the idea of set theoretic action uh, that models an action uh, with the use of three set, three sets. And so we have a set of propositions P, and an action uh, is uh, going to be represented as a precondition. So um, some sort of set of propositions that have to be satisfied in the environment for the action to Cure positive effects, so how the actions changes the situation, and negative effects. So positive effects, how it changes to the positive, so which propositions become true after the action is performed, and negative, which propositions become false after the action is performed. Right? So all these issues of intentionality and, and all these things related to philosophy of action, they are somehow invisible here. Um, the question is how much of this can we actually sneak into and, and there is a lot, there are many many logicians that work on those issues especially in the field of dynamic systemic logic but yeah this would be the simplest uh, idea right so an action is just that conditions under which it can be performed its positive effects and its negative effects on top of that simple interpretation there is a number of languages in artificial intelligence that allow us to talk about um, actions. So uh, the most popular language is called strips and it's kind of a first order language. Uh, I mean not all of them are in the sense that they are uh, they talk about predicates being true of some sort of objects in the um, in, in the universe that we have. So here for instance all of those are examples of one particular um, action and this is an action of switching on a light. So there is a button and um, 
the button, if you press it, uh, if you press it, it puts the light on um, if the light is off. Right, so here this slide only shows you the syntax of um, this particular language of actions, so we can see how they differ. This uh, tool below here, uh, they actually correspond to the stochastic or probabilistic uh, techniques um, that allow uh, to predict that the outcome will happen with some sort of probability. The dynamic epistemic logic language uh, that I'm mostly interested in in my work, um, it's, um, it's different. Uh, it's different than those uh, because it actually proposes that uh, any action uh, has some sort of internal structure by itself that can code uh, the partiality or the uncertainty, partiality of observations or the uncertainty of an agent. So here is an example of um, a situation in which we have an epistemic model for those of you that are not familiar with epistemic logic at all, I, I really apologize. I will try to explain it as clearly as possible, but some sort of, um, I have to assume something. So here in this epistemic model, we just have one possible world, and it causes the situation that the coin uh, faces heads up. Okay, so the idea is that I just look at the table and I can see a coin facing heads up. Now I take a cup, I put uh, the coin in my cup, and I shake it, and I turn the cup upside down on the table. And the idea is that this action model represents that action. So inside of the action, we have two events, two possible events that could have happened. Both of them happen unconditionally, so they don't have any preconditions. It's just, I mean, whatever, they will happen. And one of them uh, turns the heads to be true, and the other one turns the heads to be false. So um, those two events are connected with an uncertainty relation uh, that represents this, the, the fact that I, during performing this action, could not distinguish between those two events. So I knew that something happened, but I didn't know, I cannot know which one of those happens. Now, what we do in order to calculate the resulting epistemic model is that we try to somehow take a product of those two things. And this is a very nice computationally feasible procedure. That's why the DEL action models are so nice, because they have this component. So we look at uh, the starting model, and we look at the events in our uh, event model, and our action model, and we look if um, they could be applied. And since here the precondition is just a tautology, we can apply this event in this model and preserve it in our resulting state, and as well for the other um, for the epistemic uh, state uh, given uh, this event model. It can be applied because the precondition is tautology, but it switches the truth value of heads into false. So as a result, we get an epistemic model that represents my uncertainty between those two options. So one of them is the um, heads up and the other one is tails up. And I don't know which is which. I mean, I don't know which actually is in fact uh, the result. And this comes from Alexandros Larry's uh, and Solesky's paper, um, very famous BMS paper from 98, in which they introduced this model. Um, so just a side note, uh, I will run a little bit out of time, uh, but we started a little bit later because of the slides problem. Is that fine by you? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm sorry for that. But... It's all right. Um, Okay, so we look at all those things, right? And I mean, they are very nice uh, if you implement, if you know what actions are supposed to do, you can write these descriptions also here. And they work very well in terms of computing the outcome of an action. But how do you actually come up with these action representations? That's an interesting question, right? So, I mean, you probably thought, Jesus, what is this, right? I mean, it's 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 it makes sense, especially when you're trying to compute from the starting point to the result through this. But how do you come up with this representation? And also with those representations. And uh, in my work, uh, which is not isolated in the field of AI, uh, I am trying to nowadays uh, to figure out what would be the good methods of actually obtaining these action representations. 
And here is where grammar inference comes in. So when you think of grammar inference, the idea there is that you have a set of strings and you're trying to infer the finite automaton that generates this set of strings or accepts this set of strings. Here, what we would like to have is that I observe action executions and I want to learn the action model that underlies um, the particular action. Right? And this is what we would like to happen uh, in learning of action models. So, of course, the general motivation is quite broad. Um, you have an action model and the action model can be used both for action learning and for action planning. On top of that, we could actually imagine that those two operations of action learning and planning a sequence of action in order to achieve a certain goal, they're actually extremely interconnected. And because you could even imagine having a robot that is just starting in an environment and it kind of learns a little bit, then it plans what it wants to learn, so it performs a sequence of actions, maybe it fails, so it learns from that, and then it switches again to learning just without any planning, just looking at stuff. So these two things, these two processes, ideally, could be uh, interconnected. Okay. So to sum up, an action model learning uh, can be summed up as follows. So the question is how an action works on the basis of examples or observations of previous executions of actions. The output of the learning process is an action model, um, and it most, uh, it's mostly given as a representation of the action's preconditions and its effects. And um, yeah, here I have this statement uh, just for you to remember that learning problems are inherently hard. I don't know how this statement ended up here again, but okay, I mean, you should remember that it's inherently hard. But uh, these four points here, uh, they actually sum up uh, the whole question. So if we look at the existing um, research on this, uh, there's been a lot uh, that has been done already. So this is, uh, comes from an overview paper that we are currently working on together with uh, Thomas and uh, my PhD student, uh, Andres Ocipinti Lieberman, uh, here at DTU. So we actually look at different um, paradigms in which, um, excuse me, um, yeah, I'm very sorry for that. I have a year old niece, um, she's calling me all the time, um, randomly, so excuse me. <laughs> okay. uh, um, yes. Uh, so now, um, in this table, you have the overview of different approaches. So we have um, observability conditions. So full observations means that we can observe transitions directly without any restrictions. Partial observations means that not everything in the environment is observable. Some observations can be noisy and they can be partial and noisy at the same time, which is even worse. And then on this, in, this, uh, in the columns, you can see different types of actions, deterministic, unconditional, deterministic, conditional, stochastic and so on. And here, if you look very closely, you can see that our work with Thomas fits here in deterministic uh, conditional action. So we managed to contribute to this particular um, thing. And our model is the only one that actually deals with uh, dynamic epistemic logic uh, action models. So all of the others are concerned with versions of uh, strips or PDDL languages that I mentioned before. Right, so it's quite a big field. The difficulty with artificial intelligence in this uh, direction is that uh, there is uh, the really the common framework is lacking here. So it's it's very difficult to transition from one learning mo model to another. Um, and yes, um, those are the issues here. So, of course, the question is also what would be a satisfactory outcome for a learning process like that? And most frameworks that I just listed in the previous table, they uh, have a sort of this flavor of approximate learning and they are validated empirically. Uh, they have no complexity guarantees and they have very doubtful interpretability when it comes to this explainable AI problem. So, um, you know, you got there's some sort of mind change policy that allows you to switch from one conjecture to another. And we see that it works kind of with respect to certain benchmark 
or in certain domain, and we compare it to other machine learning algorithms. Exact learning what I work with, it has a um, different flavor. So it gives both space and time complexity, sample complexity. You can also think of mistake bounded planning so that you allow several mistakes. And exact learning in my sense can uh, mean either finite learning. So you learn the representation of an action in finitely many steps or in the limit. So from some point on you arrive at the right representation, but you don't know when this point is reached. So you have just a reliable way of learning, changing your mind without a finite, finite outcome. But still it's different than having an outcome in finite time that is likely right. And so those are different, methodologically different approaches. Okay, so just a final couple of slides to tell you exactly what we are working with uh, here in uh, dynamic epistemic logic. So the idea is that agents learn from observations and uh, an observation is a stream of particular pairs, um, infinite sequence in the sense that it's open-ended, so we don't know, I mean, it's just as, as observations go. You, you move around in the environment and you see different things happening, and uh, the observations are the initial state and the resulting state, so a pair of input-output situations. And the idea is that there should, it should underlie the, the, the aspect that when I execute an action in the state S, I will uh, result in S prime. And now, while observing uh, such pairs, you are allowed to give a conjecture about what is the underlying representation of the action, in our case, in dynamic epistemic logic the language. So, uh, two conditions can be given. Uh, one is that uh, you finitely identify it. So, after finitely many observations, you hold the process, the learning algorithm, with a conclusion that is given directly. And you have a guarantee, perhaps in a certain domain, that this will actually happen. Or you can have identifiability in the limit concern, so you never hold, but after finitely many observations, you settle on one action model. The learner does not know that they already settled because they always allow that there might be an observation that will change their mind, but in fact, it won't come because of the design of the learning algorithm given a domain. So we have these two learning conditions uh, that you're probably familiar from uh, if you work, know the work of Kevin Kelly or my work. Um, so for instance, uh, a trivial example for the case of a light switch domain, this would be an infinite stream of observations. The light is off, the light is on. The light was on, the light is off. Empty set represents that everything is false in the domain and so on. Right? So this is what we would call a consecutive stream of observ observations, so actions are executed step by step, uh, linking uh, states incrementally from one to the other. You can also imagine a different observation stream in which a learner does not see them consecutively, but just sees random executions, single executions of actions, so they don't have to be consecutive in this sense. Is that clear so far? No questions? Yeah, I have a question, but... I'll, I'll, I'll ask it later. Okay. Uh, so just to give you a flavor, uh, we managed to establish two basic results for now. Uh, in, I mean, in the old paper, now we are working on extensions, but um, in the paper that I refer to here, um, the set of deterministic actions in dynamic epistemic logic is finitely identifiable. The set of possibly non-deterministic actions, so the full set of actions is not finitely identifiable, only identifiable in the limit. Uh, those results uh, look very fancy when you write them like that, but they're actually quite simple if you're familiar with um, computational learning theory. So they rely on, on, on mostly on the fact that we have finitely many propositions or a growing open-ended uh, finite set of propositions. So let me give you the flavor of the theorem one. So one of the algorithms, one of the learning methods that we propose is learning uh, by uh, eliminating nodes. So uh, the idea is very close to dynamic epistemic logic here. Um, so learning facts in dynamic epistemic logic is often modeled as eliminating possible worlds. So for instance, if we take the example of our uh, head, heads up coin on the table, we, we ended up in this situation in which uh, the coin is either heads up or heads uh, down, tails up. And we don't know which is the case because the coin is under the cup. That's our situation. Now, if somebody tells us, like the actual state of affairs, 
then we can eliminate. So if they told us that, had, that the, the, the coin is actually heads up, for instance, we look ourselves or somebody communicates this trustworthy information, then we can eliminate the other option. And what you can see here is that the uncertainty between the states disappears. So now we are certain. From uncertainty, when we went to certainty of the state. So this is what very often is used as a learning method in dynamic epistemic logic. It's not the whole story because very often eliminating is not a good idea, especially if you don't trust the source of information. So just take it with a grain of salt. What I propose in the paper is that um, we could think of learning actions in a similar way, especially if we are focusing on deterministic actions. So if in advance we, we want to be a learner that learns deterministic actions, so actions that do not branch the reality into two different uh, randomly or whatever into different outcomes, but it's always deterministic. Then thinking of um, learning in this uh, way of eliminating possible events from our action model could uh, be a good idea. And here, for instance, I could have some two propositions, L and R, and it could stand, for instance, for having two light bulbs on the left and on the right. And uh, my two hypotheses is that when I switch the button unconditionally, the left goes up or the right goes up. And I want to learn a deterministic action, so I want to learn an action which only gives one outcome. This is my assumption on the learning process. Then if I observe an execution of an action that does not, that, that does turn the left lamp on, then I can eliminate the other event from my action model. And this is what I would call learning by determinizing. And this is just one example of learning method that we are concerned with in our paper. So of course, uh, this type of learning can be quite inefficient because even for two propositions, what happens is that you actually end up with a quite broad set of possibilities. Those all are events that correspond to an action, either unconditionally changing a P and Q to be true or changing both of them to be false. Um, or doing nothing, or just changing P to be true, and so on. This Rosetta picture corresponds actually to observations, so each of the sets um, codes an observation that you can see in the learning process that is consistent with such events. So, okay, it requires a little bit of looking at, but I thought it's nice to show it in the presentation because it's a very pretty picture. But, but just to be concrete, if you start with this picture, and you observe um, the transition from Q. So in the starting point, only Q was true. And in the resulting state, P and Q are true. Then what happens is um, that this observation will correspond to this particular bunch of events. So an event that changes P to be true and an event that changes unconditionally P and Q to be true. Right? So we have to, so from this big representation, exponential representation of uh, the action, everything is possible, the action could do anything. After one observation, we can restrict, if we are concerned with deterministic actions, we can restrict our hypothesis space to just those two options. Okay. So here I hope that we will be able to somehow make the slides available to the audience after the lecture. Um, is that uh, possible? Uh, absolutely, yes. So uh, I won't go into details of the learning definitions, but if anybody is interested, I really um, encourage to like look into those. Um, this particular um, framework, type way of defining things, is quite common in our paper, and it corresponds to um, representing a learning algorithm as a function that answers certain things under certain conditions. And the idea here is to achieve finite learnability by guaranteeing that the learning function at some point outputs uh, a model, uh, given that in all the previous steps, uh, the answer was in specific, unspecific. So just um, like an up arrow answer that they, they are just not ready to answer. And they are not ready to answer until they reach a certain point, under a certain condition satisfied, and then they output an action model. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's the witness, so um, the deterministic action models are finally identifiable by this learner. Yes. So I should finish now. Um, let me just show you a small example. 
So here we have a learning process for um, conditional deterministic action of a light switch. There is like an on and off button. So if I press it once, it turns the light on. I press it again, it turns the light off and so on. And our learning process proceeds through the elimination learning process. One example of our learning method proceeds through a sequence of steps. So each time I see an observation of an action execution, I do something to the space of, to the hypothesis space, namely I remove the inconsistent events. So here, for instance, we have all possibilities given one proposition. So for instance, unconditionally everything becomes false, conditionally on P everything becomes false, so P becomes false, conditionally on not P, P becomes false, uh, and so on. Oh, sorry, nothing happens. Uh, the empty set corresponds here to nothing happens, it's the wrong side of them. And here we have uh, the P becomes true, P becomes false, here unconditionally, and here conditionally on not P and P. And then upon observing a certain transition, I can know that I can eliminate certain um, elements of my domain. So for instance, I can eliminate the event in which um, conditionally of not P, so not P was false, nothing happened. Because not P was false, but something happened. So I can eliminate this event from my, uh, from my uh, space of uh, dynamic epistemic model, action model, and so on. Right, so this is the application of the previous definition. And here we can see the output of the learning function after the second step. Sometimes these things can be uh, trickier because uh, you can end up with more than one model that uh, allows you to, so the space of both events actually allow you to uh, have two different uh, ways in which the action can be represented. Uh, but then we use logic in order to minimize this model and uh, arrive at one correct solution. Okay, I'm sure there will be some questions, but for now, conclusions. So all of this elaborate introduction to this uh, work going through explainable AI was to somehow justify why we would even do such things. Um, you might say, you know, I mean, you want to learn an action, just you know, apply some sort of known machine learning technique, um, make associations between states, starting states and resulting states, see if they are um, strong enough, and then claim that you learned because you have a system that allows you to predict what will happen when an action is executed. I would say, okay, you can do that, but maybe you can do more by involving the symbolic learning methods, which allow you to actually present the underlying structure of an action action um, in some logical language. And that's where um, dynamic epistemic logic and other action languages come in handy because they offer insight into what an action actually does on the logical level, on the level of local propositions in logic. So now further work. Um, there are oh, so many open uh, directions. If you'd like to work on this on, or think of this, please contact me because it's a big topic. Um, right now we are working on extending uh, our very basic uh, framework to epistemic actions in order to cover the full dynamic epistemic logic. Um, we want to have many agents that communicate, so can, can also learn from other agents and they learn simultaneously. And here is the part that I didn't ever touch, but I think it's important given what I uh, talked about in this talk. Uh, is the relationship of AI representation of actions with cognitive theories of, of actions that he is, that is really not touched almost, I would say, in, in any significant way. Uh, and finally, we could look at, given our joint uh, pool of backgrounds here, even in this uh, group of people, Look at how logical theories of counterfactuals, explanation, and justification can contribute to understanding what explanations of artificial intelligence can be. Um, we have a lot of um, work on, especially model logic, epistemic logic, on evidence, justification. We have a lot of uh, linguistic or counterfactuals, uh, philosophy of language, also even. Uh, like critical um, philosophy here, uh, but they they are rarely connected with um, the working artificial intelligence community. 
So those things are quite separated, in my opinion, from what I could see from my reviewing, for instance. So yes, that's it. And here is some tiny bibliography of the topic. The final paper, unfortunately, is still in progress. Uh, and all of these papers are notoriously difficult to write because you have to read a lot. We don't have time for this so much. But uh, it will come out soon, I hope. So yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for the attention. I'm sorry for running out of time. We have a number of issues. Thanks, Nina. Thank you. Thanks for the for the great overview of 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 the, all this work. Uh, does anyone wants to uh, ask questions? I I. Um, Giuseppe, may I ask a sort of a general question? Well, first of all, thank you very much. I enjoyed very much the talk, and also also because I I could follow it, which is not what usually happens with talks. So. I'm super glad to hear that because you know <laughs> just with these technical solutions now, it's very hard to know if people are even there. Yeah. Uh, okay, and uh, and uh, I was wondering, uh, given the begin the beginning of your talk, when you explained us uh, to us. Uh, what uh, explainable AI is, uh, whether there's, you, you investigated some connection with the work people do in formal argumentation, because there is some sort of uh, machinery there that could be used in order to uh, to explain, I mean, to use this argumentation dialogues in order to explain yes. things, and it's been investigated quite a, quite a bit in uh, informal argumentation. Which yeah. argumentation framework you would think to be useful, like more the one from model logic or? or um... Well, it depends. I mean, I was just asking a general question whether you have investigated this connection with the uh, formal argument, structure formal argumentation. I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm in a Doom style argumentation theory, uh, but structured, which means that uh, that um, that uh, the, the 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 nodes are are instantiated by arguments. Yes. Uh, yeah, I I really uh, like this framework, and I think maybe we could look at that because um, I did analyze the learning uh, mode, learning um, problematics in general with the use of sabotage uh, logic. Uh, are you familiar with sabotage framework? The idea there is that you have a graph of nodes and they correspond to some sort of states, they can be whatever. And there is a game between a learner and the teacher. And the idea is that learner travels through the graph and the teacher removes the connections uh, between uh, certain topics. And then you can think of a learning model, learning problem as a reachability problem. So the learner wants to reach from the starting state to the desired knowledge state, while the teacher is making it easier or harder depending on what kind of teacher you are. You have, and I think this maybe is close to the standard representation of um, of argumentation. Um, what my issue is here a little bit is to what extent. So we would have to specify on what level of explainable AI we we are, right? Because um, of course there is the issue of making explanations argument like argumentatively, I don't know how to say that, but convincing. OK, OK, yeah. so the explanation should be convincing. So they should have some sort of argumentative power. But I'm not sure if if the frameworks that I know, at least I'm not familiar with argumentation theory so much, uh, if they offer enough insight into um, this way of thinking uh, or which one would. So yeah, I mean, but it's of course. Uh, OK, OK, I think there is room there for um, for finding connections. Maybe we can uh, uh, have some exchange by email about that, if you want. Yeah, we already were supposed to before on something else, so maybe it's a good idea. To... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> yes, of course. Yes, we should try and, and do it this time. Yeah, yeah, it would be great. OK. Anyone? Question or request for clarification? Uh, I have a question. Giuseppe? Go oh, ahead. Sorry. Yes, Pere, Pere, go ahead. Yes. Please. OK, so thank you, Nina, for your talk. I, um, I think, so going to these last slides before the conclusions, um, in this last part, yes, uh, uh, before, yes. So I, I understood this model quite well, I think, but I didn't understand the, the formal definition of this mean operator before, yeah. in the slide before. Sure, uh, I can explain uh, if you would like. Yeah. yeah. So, 
So my, my question is, is so this, this operator computes the logically weakest precondition or something like that? Yes. Okay. So, so well, please, please uh, explain if you want. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a bit, uh, it's, uh, there is a lag in the, in the sound, so I think we are just interrupting each other. Would you like to finish your question first? Well, no, my question was just why doesn't it mention the post conditions? Uh, ah. Um, why doesn't it mention post conditions? Um, so the idea here for this particular part of um, of the um, of the presentation rather than the actual work that I did in the background is that we want to focus on deterministic actions. Because I just wanted to show you an example of learning that would proceed by determinizing the action model. So we, we eliminate certain events in the process. And this only works if we assume that actions are deterministic. But if actions are deterministic, then there is never an ambiguity about a post condition. Because the actions are just functions from one state to another. Right? So somehow this issue of post condition is thrown out by, by the okay. setup of this particular learning. However, there is still the issue if you want to look at the other side of, so not, okay, post conditions concern outputs. Preconditions concern inputs. Now, if you want to uh, model conditional actions, so there are actions that are unconditional, actions that occur under any circumstances, right? So, like, there is no, there is no precondition that has to be specifically true. I mean, tautology is a good precondition in such situations. But if you want to have conditional actions, so a button that uh, switches the light on and off, depending on what it was before, like it only switches this on if it was off before, um, or you know, so. uh, then the issue of preconditions becomes. Uh, very important, right? Because um, mm -hmm. I mean, depending on the precondition, you will have a different function simply here. Okay. Yes, I I think I understand. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So now, if you look at the second uh, example, for instance, so what we obtained here. So this this is an on button. So this is an uh, this is a conditional deterministic action of just turning the light on. So it's not a button that turns the light on and off, but just on, like the ones with the time timer or whatever, right? So you just turn it on and it, it's on until it's off by itself. And here we have, um, so it's possible to observe P, uh, light being off and then being on, and light being on and after the execution of action still being on. So what happens in the end is that after we run this process of elimination, we end up with some sort of a weird combination of things. So either we have an unconditional change in P to be true, or we have conditional changing. If P is true, it becomes false. And if P, uh, if P is true, then nothing happens. Or if uh, not P is true, then uh, P becomes true. So then you might be crucially concerned with finding some minimum maybe because you want the, the still the learner to somehow the, the the agent to perform in the world without the ambiguity and then you might resort to logic and look for the minimal uh, or whatever in this case a tautology um, that would give you the smallest under some computational requirements smallest representation of uh, action right mm -hmm. so Sometimes it is crucial to have that. I mean, of course you can, I mean, in these examples you could store this many, but it really easily becomes huge, this representation, um, because we start with an exponential with respect to the number of propositions. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I hope it answers. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Yes, yes. And so, I have just another short question, if possible. Of course. Um, so, so what do you mean when you say that you want this to expand the system so that it can learn an epistemic action like how can it, a private announcement for example can this be learned 
Yes. So we are now in this crazy period with the work in which we are exploring like all sorts of weird situations of learning. Like um, if I have a button in one room and I try to switch uh, and I press it and I don't see any change. But then there is maybe another room in which the light went off or went on when I pressed the button. So this corresponds to partial observation. Perhaps I can have another agent in the other room that communicates um, the, that something changed and I can match that with uh, my representation of action. So then the question is how do you learn such, such domains and also um, how do you learn the communication itself and the results of it. Uh, for instance, you could think of okay, a public announcement, learning a public announcement could happen. I mean, after a while in life, we learn that public announcement has certain consequences, right? And we, we do that by observing probably the situations that occurred, um, that um, output that occurred after public announcement. And we can distinguish them from gossip as a different type of um, actions that uh, render different results. So, I mean, this is inherently hard because it's very hard to think of observations in partially observable domains, right? And also yeah. you think about mental um, uh, structures like knowledge or belief. It's also very hard to um, think, but then we resort to communication as a sort of uh, sort of source of information. Um, so that's what I mean. I mean, public announcement is the easiest to learn, of course, because it's it's just eliminating things that are inconsistent with the announcement itself for all the agents. So it's sort of, um, but then there are all these uh, more complex um, operators like private announcement or um, announcement that are not very reliable for all sorts of reasons, so that result in belief rather than knowledge. So yes, that's, um, that's the, I mean, there's a lot happening now, but it's all very preliminary. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Ina. Mm -hmm. So if I can follow up on, on the uh, partiality uh, issue, I was uh, thinking on those, exactly on those line. Uh, and in the case of, uh, of course, in the case of deterministic action is uh, maybe less evident, but in the case of probabilistic action is very, very uh, clear, at least to me, that um, you can think of situation where you are observing the behavior of a system and uh, you can attribute the si certain actions to the system, but uh, uh, due to the partiality of your observation, or maybe because the actions that you are seeing happening are only um, uh, a probabilistically, uh, a probabilistic distribution over a number of possible action, your attribution of actions, possible actions to the system are uh, limited with respect to the system itself. So you do not cover the old set of possible actions that the system uh, could. So I was thinking in terms of your example, right, you are somehow already assuming that when you have uh, the epistemic state of the agent that doesn't know whether it is head of or tails, you are already somehow assuming that the action of throwing the coin might return head of tail with equal probability, right? So that seems to me a very strong assumption uh, uh, or at least it it, it, it cuts off a, a, a lot of issues. So now that you mentioned this, this issue of partial observability, uh, it seems it goes in that direction. So maybe you can say a few more words if that is in line of what you're thinking uh, uh, as extension of this uh, of this research. Yeah, there are two things that I can say. One is that, three things. <laughs> One is that um, directly relating to, to the, the, your question, uh, there is a probabilistic dynamic epistemic logic that, that does that. So it uh, sort of uh, some of the versions actually assign the probabilities on the edges, uh, so or, or on the walls, depending. And you can you can have update of that type um, that you look at how um, how to update an epistemic probabilistic epistemic model with a probabilistic event obtaining a new probabilistic model and this I think has been recently applied in a couple of years ago in some master thesis in Amsterdam to uh, pluralistic ignorance or informational cascades one of this phenomenon with uh, many agents and the probabilities accumulated so that part hopefully could be covered which brings me to my second point that what I'm here after in this work it's a little bit uh, 
old fashioned in the sense that I, I like the idea of making some sort of uniform framework that would be a little bit like uh, automata theory or language theory for actions. And then we could claim that these different languages for actions, they actually are just different representation for this underlying structure, right? So that's why I kind of forget about the probabilistic issues because I would like to have a symbolic representation, but it doesn't mean that I don't don't respect that don't or I, that I want to ignore it. It's just that uh, it feels like first we got to understand how things work with certainty and then we can kind of play with numbers on top of that. Uh, and I wanted to say something else in relation to that. Yes, there is something that is extremely annoying in artificial intelligence in the sense that very often papers start with, uh, let's assume a finite set of propositions, right? So it's like, we assume that the agent already knows what is relevant for the action to happen. Right, yes, that, and that's exactly what I was referring yes. to, right? And, and that's, that's something that me, like the old me that is a philosopher or, or a logician, in this new field, I each time have to uh, cringe and like, okay, let's do that. I mean, let's do that because that's how we do things with robots. Right? I mean, the, the, but of course, you, there is the question of uh, working with an open domain in which the agent can see new things, assign new propositions. Right. So, what I'm more tempted to do now is think of an unlimited set of propositions. So, in fact, an infinite set of propositions of which the agent only makes finite um, use at a given time. And then depending on how the observations go on, you can assign more uh, propositions to facts that change. But uh, yet again, if you think about AI, it's a question of how the perceptrons are working. So what is it that the agent perceives the sort of aspects of the situation? So um, I don't want to throw away the engineering aspect. What I'm saying is that the, the frameworks of learning that I work with or the formal learning theory or computational learning, learning theory deals with, they don't require this restriction to find any proposition. So the set can be an infinite set. It's just a matter of how much you observe in the learning that matters to you. So I have some hope with that, but I understand that it relates also to the notion of surprise and uh, expectations and all these things that are super relevant in learning, uh, but they're just not, not there. Um, they're too soft for the community, I think, still, like they're too philosophical. Um, but I think it's coming for sure. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question? All right. So if not, um, let's thank Nina again uh, for a very inspiring uh, talk. Yep. And uh, we 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 are promising all the people, all the all the persons that we invited that real person's invitations are following up as soon as possible. So let's hope that we can do this uh, live and keep on discussing anyway. Yes, so uh, I would like to send you the slides after uh, maybe you can distribute them. Yes, we will. We will put them up on uh, uh, certainly on the team uh, also, uh, also, Lina, you are aware we have recorded the talk, right? Yes, I'm very aware of that and I'm very happy about that. Okay, excellent. Maybe this means that I will not have to repeat this talk ever again. So. <laughs> <laughs>